The next item of business is First Minister's questions, and at question number one, I call Douglas Ross. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. And can I begin by wishing Her Majesty the Queen a very happy 96th birthday? <laughs> on behalf of the whole chamber uh, and people across Scotland, we send our best wishes to the monarch who has been a constant in our country for many decades. Through good times and difficult periods, while the country has been at war and during peacetime, a global figure and our remarkable head of state, yeah. uh, and I know everyone in this chamber will join us in wishing Her Majesty a very happy birthday. Can I ask the First Minister if she supports plans for drivers who live outside Edinburgh and Glasgow to be charged extra to get into Scotland's two largest cities? First Minister. Firstly, uh, Presiding Officer, can I also take the opportunity to wish Her Majesty a very happy 96th birthday today. Um, her service has been, continues to be, an inspiration to many, not just in Scotland and the UK, but across the world. And I know all of us, in sending her our very best wishes today, will also wish her uh, many happy returns. Um, I think it is right that we support uh, those who require to use our roads uh, and that we do that in a range of ways, uh, for example, ensuring uh, the good maintenance of our roads, uh, pressing for action on the part of the UK uh, Government to cut uh, the cost of uh, motoring, particularly just now when people are suffering uh, from cost of living. But of course, we also, all of us, have a big uh, responsibility to ensure that we make the transition to net zero, and that means decarbonising our transport uh, system. So local authorities uh, will consult on a range uh, of issues, and it's important uh, that those responsibilities abilities uh, are kept in our minds, but also the views of the wider public are taken fully into account. Douglas Ross. So the First Minister wants to support those who use our roads, and her answer, tax them more. Because the SNP government bought, brought in the workplace parking tax, and the SNP group in Edinburgh has charged ahead with plans to introduce it. Mm -hmm. Plans that would hit anyone who needs their car to get in to work in the city. And now in their manifesto for the local election, the SNP have included proposals to charge vehicles just to come in to the capital. It's a commuter tax on people all over the country who travel to work in Edinburgh, who come to do business, to visit family and friends, or to use vital services. Scottish Conservatives are completely opposed to this proposal. So why are the SNP intent on making driving in our cities unaffordable? First Minister. I think uh, perhaps on many issues, Douglas Ross needs to decide what his position actually is and avoid uh, rendering himself uh, ridiculous by having contradictory and inconsistent positions. Uh, talking of manifestos, let me first of all uh, quote the Tory local government manifesto from 2017, which says this, we need to empower councils and give them a renewed sense of meaning and purpose. And I can hear Douglas Ross say that's not up to date enough. So let me quote the Conservative manifesto from the Scottish Parliament election just this time last year. And again, I am quoting, councils should lead post-COVID reviews of changed travel patterns in their areas and be encouraged to create more low traffic neighbourhoods. So on the one hand, Douglas Ross wants to empower local councils and then he stands up there and says uh, that I should rule out the ability of local councils deciding uh, on things uh, that could help us with that transition to net zero, uh, while of course supporting uh, travel patterns across the country, not for the first time presiding officer and I suspect not for the last time. Uh, Douglas Ross's position is completely inconsistent uh, and bordering on being ridiculous. <laughs> bordering on ridiculous is that dismal answer. Well, two things in bordering on ridiculous are the fact that SNP backbenchers think that was a good answer, but yeah, also yeah, yeah. the complete deflection from the proposals from the SNP. Nothing from the leader of the SNP yeah. or from the First Minister about the specific question I asked and her pre-prepared answers of what I might or might not have said don't really sit well. <laughs> My... no, no. Colleagues, no, no. colleagues, well, Colleagues, thank you. Listen, listen. 
her pre-prepared answers on what I may or may not have come to this chamber to say. I don't know what's difficult for the SNP to understand. The First Minister, the First Excuse Minister, me, Mr. Ross, can we please hear Mr. Ross? Thank you. The First Minister is trying to predict what I would say at First Minister's questions, has a script ready to yeah. answer yeah. that had nothing to do with the yeah, issue absolutely. that we are raising. It's about SNP raising the cost of driving cars in cities that people rely on to get to work, to visit yeah. friends and family, to use vital services. And in response to the news of this commuter tax, the Federation of Small Businesses this morning urged councils to avoid additional cost for business. Yeah. They make it clear that a commuter tax would hit tradespeople coming from the Lothians, the Borders, Fife and further afield. And it's not just those areas that will be hit with extra charges from SNP councillors. Anyone working in Glasgow also faces the prospect of extra charges for driving into their city. Glasgow SNP leader Susan Aitken has suggested capping traffic on the M8. She's also considering introducing toll roads. First Minister, a previous SNP government scrapped those charges. Will you stand up and give a categorical answer that you will not bring them back in again? First Minister. I think Douglas Ross uh, might want to reflect on the fact that the Chamber wasn't laughing uh, with him uh, a few moments <laughs> ago. Um, because I was quoting from uh, Conservative manifestos uh, that actually put their finger on the really important issue here. I think everybody across the country, um, and certainly everybody in this chamber, knows that all of us, not just in Scotland, but across the world, face some really uh, difficult, tough, challenging decisions in the years to come about how we heat our homes uh, and also how we travel around the country so that we can meet so that we can meet our climate change obligations, make that transition to net zero, but have a transport system uh, that still supports our economy um, and supports the, the travelling public. So uh, it's easy for uh, the Scottish Conservatives to reduce uh, these uh, challenging decisions in the simplistic way that they have, but the rest of us know uh, that these decisions have to be uh, faced. And this is about empowering local councils to consult on these decisions, to consider the options and to arrive at decisions. Um, and that uh, is what we are doing. It is what the Conservatives used to support but clearly now uh, don't. Uh, but we as a government continue to support uh, the transport system across the country. Since this government took office, uh, we have invested in excess of £9.5 billion in managing, maintaining, improving Scotland's trunk roads and our motor work, uh, motorway network. We're also investing over £500 million for bus priority measures to support people out of cars. Uh, so we will continue to take the tough decisions, uh, we will continue to consult the public and come to sensible decisions and back those decisions with investments. That's serious government as opposed to ridiculous opposition. Oh. <laughs> questions so far to the First Minister and zero answers. No it was a very no straightforward answers. question. Would the First Minister rule out road tolls being reintroduced in Scotland? And she was silent, didn't even attempt yeah. to answer that question. But of course, across the Chamber, all parties agree on the need to do more to meet our climate change targets. But, well, well SNP members laugh about this, but in many industries and across rural... And across rural areas especially, people still need their cars. Yeah. And there, right now, there couldn't be a worse time to further hike the cost of driving. We're in the middle of a cost of living crisis. Petrol prices are rising globally. Yet Nicola Sturgeon wants to tax people off the road by hammering anyone who owns a car. And the people who will be hit hardest are not the wealthiest but ordinary working people who need their cars and who are already struggling with the cost of living. If the First Minister carries on down this road, Nicola Sturgeon and her SNP candidates are going to force Scotland's economy into the slow lane. The commuter tax should be abandoned. Toll charges should be ruled out, First Minister, and her workplace parking tax should be ditched. First Minister, will you drop this triple whammy of anti-driver taxes? First Minister... I don't, I don't support uh, road tolls, but I do support local councils being empowered to consider the tough issues that they face, to consult with the public, 
and to take excuse sensible me, First decisions. Minister. Excuse me, me, First Minister. Two. First Minister. Sorry. We will hear the First Minister. Yeah. Thank you. And I'll say two further things. Yes, people do uh, continue to need their cars, particularly in rural and remote parts of our country, which is why this government has invested so heavily in maintaining and improving our trunk road and our motorway network. We've delivered improvements right across the country uh, to meet the needs of all of the population, including the Queensferry Crossing, the Aberdeen Western Peripheral Route, the M8, M73, M74 motorway improvements, uh, and we will continue to do so. But the final point I would make, Presiding Officer, which I know is one that Douglas Ross uh, will not want to face up to, what is hammering uh, people, uh, including motorists right now across the country, is the Tory-created cost-of-living crisis, which an out-of-touch Prime Minister and an out-of-touch Chancellor of the Exchequer refused to do enough about. Perhaps we should focus on the immediate problems being faced by people and the solutions that need to come from Douglas Ross's colleagues at Westminster. Question number two, Anna Sarwa. Presenter, can I join others in wishing Her Majesty the Queen a very happy 96th birthday and on this her Platinum Jubilee year thank her again for her service. Uh, Officer, before Easter, I highlighted the £2 million that the Government wasted on a turnaround manager at Ferguson's who left the yard in a worse state than he found it. The First Minister supported paying him nearly £3,000 a day while, the, while Scots faced a cost of living crisis. But this is not the only waste of public money that the First Minister has supported. So can the First Minister tell the Chamber how much money her Government has wasted since 2007 because of delays, loan write-offs or avoidable spending? First Minister. Um, I don't have uh, that figure uh, to hand. I'm happy to look at that. I'm, I suspect uh, the way Anna Sarwar is characterising that uh, may not be entirely one that I would agree with, but I'm more than happy to look at his question in the detail of that and uh, write to him with uh, the information in due course. Anna Sarwar. Officer, the answer is over £3 billion. That is the cost of SNP failure, the loss of public money due to SNP incompetence. And the list is endless. £152 million on a failed credit contract at Ferguson's. £146 million fixing the government's mistakes at the Edinburgh Sick Kids and the Queen Elizabeth in Glasgow. £40 million and rising on the malicious prosecution of Rangers. Almost £200 million on failed industrial interventions and loan write-offs. Nearly a billion pounds for agency workers in the health service because Nicola Sturgeon cut training places when health secretary. Over a billion pounds on delayed discharge because of their failure to fix the social care crisis. Three billion pounds. That is the equivalent of £1,200 bill for every household in Scotland. Every penny of this wasted money could mean more cash for the NHS, more cash for our schools, or more cash to tackle the cost of living crisis. Rather than helping people with the cost of living crisis, why is this government instead making them pay the cost of SNP failure? First Minister. Well, I did say uh, that I suspected uh, Anna Sarwar's characterisation of this would be an utter mischaracterisation. It turns out I was absolutely right on that. Let me, let me before I come on to this, some of the details, some of the ridiculous, I didn't think uh, the opposition would be exceeded in terms of... Uh, been ridiculous in their questioning today. Uh, but well, I'll come on to that in a second. But what Anna Sarwar failed, of course, to mention is that this government has had 15 years of unqualified accounts. Yeah. That is the reality in terms uh, of our stewardship of the public finances. But let me, let me give oh, them two. They don't understand it. They don't, they, obviously, they don't understand. obviously, they don't understand that point. It's a rather yeah. important yeah. point. Yeah. But let me come on. Let me come on to the detail. So two of the examples, one of the examples is talking about prosecution. Prosecution uh, decisions, of course, be matters for the independent yeah, Crown yeah, Office. Yeah. Uh, and yet he is, is Anna Sarwar seriously saying that I as First Minister or any minister of this government should have interfered in the independent prosecution decisions of the Crown Office? Perhaps he should clarify that matter. And then the second example I'll, I will use uh, where he is downright wrong is his uh, £146 million of additional costs in relation to hospitals. So the vast majority of that figure, and I've looked at that closely because I've heard Labour use it, relates to planned costs which were in no way new, unexpected yep. or avoidable. So for example, 80 million of uh, that related to preparatory works which were separate to the uh, main contract but were budgeted costs included in the business 
case, another £33 million pounds related to the annual service payment, also part of the original business case. Uh, so there's a lot of nonsense in the question that Anna Sarwar has just asked there, and perhaps he should reflect on that. Anna Sarwar. <laughs> Asking about wasted money, that's a waste of an answer from the First Minister right there. <laughs> £40 million pounds in a malicious prosecution, the first time ever in Scottish history. Perhaps the government should reflect on that. A hospital built for Edinburgh sick kids that failed to open, perhaps the government should reflect on that. The failures in the Glasgow Queen Elizabeth Hospital, perhaps the government should reflect on that. Because right around the country we are seeing the cost of SNP failure. And at the same time, energy bills are up, petrol prices are up, and the weekly shop is more expensive than ever. Right now in Scotland, there are mums skipping meals in order to feed their kids. People are knocking back items at food banks because they can't afford to cook them. And in the face of the biggest drop in living standards since the Second World War, both our governments are not doing enough. Instead of wasting billions of pounds paying the cost of SNP failure, we should be supporting families with the cost of living crisis. The £111 million of loan write-offs could have been used to top up the Scottish Welfare Fund. The £152 million misspent mismanaging Ferguson's could have been used to have rail fares for three months, not three weeks, and cap bus fares. The £1 billion on delayed discharge could have been used to give our care workers the pay rise they deserve. While well, families right now are being forced to account for every single penny of their spending, why does this First Minister think it's acceptable for them to pay the cost of £3.2 billion and rising of SNP failure? First Minister, there are some really, really serious issues in there. And I, I hope, uh, if not uh, during this session, then after this session, Anna Sarwar will clarify at least, well, two points actually. But firstly, this one, because this is actually a serious constitutional question. Yeah. He has twice now referenced the Rangers prosecution um, and the cost of settling that. But if he thinks that is something that I uh, could have influenced, then is he saying that ministers should have been involved in or influencing the independent prosecution decisions or intervened in any way in that? And if he is going to somehow suggest, as he has, uh, that those uh, costs are waste on the part of the SNP, then he really has to answer, he really has to answer that fundamental question. Does he think I should have interfered in the prosecution decisions of the Crown Office? The second point, going back to the £146 million in relation to the hospital, is he saying that £80 million pounds, uh, on essential preparation work shouldn't have been done for those hospitals? Because that is the logical conclusion of what he's saying. So the, the spin and the sound bites might sound good when Anna Sarwar is rehearsing these questions, but I think he should pay a bit more attention to the detail. And First, then Minister, to First the Minister, substance. if I may, there is a lot of background. Um, contribution going on in the chamber at the moment and I'd be grateful if it could cease and we could hear the First Minister. Thank you. And to come on to what I think is the important part of the question, which is the cost of living crisis. Anna Sarwar has referenced rising petrol costs and rising energy costs. Can I remind Anna Sarwar uh, that power over energy and the cost of petrol are still reserved to Westminster and if he wants to change that, then he should argue for those powers yep. to come here. And in terms of the wider cost of living, We've increased the benefits that this government is responsible for. We've doubled the child payment. And if we are able to do, if we are to be able to do more, then he needs to support us in calling for greater welfare powers to come to this parliament as well. We will now move to supplementary questions and I call Paul McKinnon. Thank you, President Officer. As the cost of living soars and thousands of families across the country are already feeling the crush of grossly inflated energy bills. Can the First Minister give an update on the number of families benefiting now from free childcare and how much money this will save them at such a critical time? First Minister. Um, over 111,000 uh, children were ac accessing funded early learning and childcare in January of these years. Uh, of this year, 87% uh, of these children uh, are taking up the full entitlement, and families who do take up the full entitlement can save up to £4,900 uh, each year for each child. And this is the most generous early learning and childcare offer anywhere in the UK. And of course, it will also deliver better uh, social and educational outcomes for Scotland's children. Brian Whittle. 
Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, First Minister, there is an estimated 132,000 people suffering from long COVID in Scotland, with 59,000 of, of those experiencing, sim experiencing symptoms for more than a year. This is a ticking time bomb, yet I think the SNP Government is merely sticking its head in the stand, having dropped the debate on long COVID from the schedule this afternoon, preventing this Parliament an opportunity to discuss this. So can I ask the First Minister, when are we going to see specialist long COVID clinics in Scotland? First Minister. Well, we are currently implementing the commitments in the long COVID uh, approach paper uh, that is all about improving care and support for people with long COVID in Scotland. Long COVID clinics are one model that health boards can consider, but we have always recognised, and I think rightly so, that no one single approach is going to fit all areas and circumstances. So health boards have to look at a range of approaches. In terms of the debate, of course, uh, we have made clear and given a commitment that we will have a debate uh, in the next few weeks. At that time, we will provide a full update on progress. Um, and the intention is that we can provide Parliament at that time with a detailed out, uh, update of the outcome of the planning process currently being undertaken with NHS boards to determine the first allocations of the Long Covid Support Fund, uh, which, of course, is what MSPs have been calling for. Monica Lennon. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The anti-abortion lobby now sees Scotland as an easy target, with campaigners following the Texas playbook. Last September, I raised concerns with the First Minister and the urgent need for protest-free buffer zones at abortion services. Does she regret that Swift's action has not been taken? And can she confirm when telemedicine for early abortion will be made permanent as Scotland is now trailing behind England and Wales on this important health care matter. First Minister. Well, firstly, can I say, uh, on behalf of the Scottish Government, but also uh, as uh, First Minister, indeed personally, uh, that we are committed to ensuring that all women are able to access timely abortions uh, without judgment. Um, I condemn, and I will do so in the strongest possible terms, any attempts to intimidate women as they choose to access abortion services. People, of course, have a right to protest against abortion, uh, but they should do that outside Parliament, where the laws are made. They should not do that outside a hospital, uh, where women are undergoing uh, abortions um, and, uh, of course, experiencing, uh, often as they do so, uh, extreme distress. Uh, the Buffer Zones Working Group uh, has been meeting uh, that is looking at ways uh, to prevent uh, any patients feeling harassed or intimidated when accessing health care. There are complex legal issues involved here and there is no uh, way of avoiding uh, saying that. Uh, we must make sure that what we do, the approach we choose, is consistent with the law. I know the Minister um, is committed to seeing if that work can be accelerated. I think she may have uh, said as much to Parliament uh, earlier today. So we will keep Parliament updated uh, on this work. But I would say again uh, to those uh, who take a different view on abortion uh, to uh, mine uh, and to the view of many people in this chamber, uh, by all means protest. Uh, you have a democratic right to do that. But come and protest at Parliament. Uh, do not intimidate women seeking access to abortion at hospitals. Mark Bristol. The proposed closure of 19 Bank of Scotland branches will mark the loss of the last bank in town in Dunblane and many other communities. And as a result, vulnerable people in Dunblane without access to digital banking would need to make a 12-mile round trip to the nearest branch. Does the First Minister agree that this move is clearly out of step with our ambition to build 20-minute neighbourhoods, regenerate our high streets and connect communities to lifeline services? First Minister. Uh, yes, I, I do share those concerns and I, I share those sentiments. I think we all understand that the way people access banking services it has changed and, and changed quite fundamentally in some respects. And of course, banks have to respond to that and make sure the services uh, they provide are reflective of that. Uh, but physical presence of uh, banks and, of course, other facilities can be very uh, important in sustaining access, but in sustaining the life of uh, local communities. And it's really important that banks try to find uh, the right balance. Uh, I uh, have personally, and the government uh, generally, has communicated these views uh, to the banking sector and will continue to do so. Stephen Kerr. Thank you, President Officer. Communities like Earth in Falkirk District are being left behind by the SNP government's funding cuts to flood prevention. Ask the people of Earth. They're caught up in a game of piggy in the middle between SEPA and Falkirk Council engaged in the worst kind of buck passing. 
How can people in villages like Earth have confidence in Nicola Sturgeon to deliver flood prevention schemes, given her record's woeful track record of cuts to local schemes? First Minister, we have provided uh, significant and sustained uh, funding for local flood prevention schemes. Of course, uh, the decisions on individual schemes and the ranking of schemes uh, are matters for local authorities. Um, I am more than happy uh, to come back to the member with any more detail I am able to provide on the Earth scheme, but it is right that local authorities uh, consult with SEPA but also with local communities in taking forward uh, these schemes. It is right that the Scottish Government continues to provide uh, funding where appropriate. Pam Duncan Glancy. Thank you, President Officer. The Homeless Project Scotland in Glasgow has today said that they see high numbers of families attending their soup kitchen. Shelter told the Social Security Committee this morning that by the end of today and every day, the equivalent of a whole classroom full of children will be homeless. What more will the government do to support the project in Glasgow, including to help it find a building to bring people together in rather than have to do it outside? And what will you do to pick up pace on building new homes in Glasgow? First Minister. Uh, firstly, I am happy to engage uh, with the Homeless Project to see if uh, there is uh, more we can do as government to try to help them find uh, a building. Uh, the work they do is extremely important. We all wish it was not necessary, but uh, I want to pay tribute to them uh, for that. Uh, over and above that, the Scottish Government will continue to do all we can to help people with this uh, cost of living, uh, which is heaping misery uh, upon people who, in many cases, were already living in poverty. The increase in benefits I have already referenced, the doubling of the child payment support for the welfare fund. All of these policies uh, will continue. Uh, Glasgow City Council, working of course uh, with its partners, has a very good record in terms of uh, delivering affordable housing. And uh, well, we'll see what happens in a couple of weeks. But uh, I know, for my part, uh, the current administration has plans to continue to build on that uh, progress. But it's incumbent on all of us. Uh, with any influence and power right now to do everything we can to help people suffering uh, with the cost of living crisis. But of course, uh, for us to do as much as we would want to do uh, does necessitate having more powers over these uh, crucial issues lying in the hands of this Parliament and not in the hands of Boris Johnson and Rishi Sunak at Westminster. Yeah. Question number three, Alex Cole Hamilton. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I, on behalf of the Scottish Liberal Democrats, echo the good wishes expressed by the Chamber to Her Majesty the Queen on the occasion of her 96th birthday, uh, to ask the First Minister when the Cabinet will next meet? First Minister. Tuesday. Alex Cole Hamilton. I am very grateful for that reply. In January, the Scottish Government announced it had sold the lion's share of Scotland's seabed for £700 million. On it will be built huge wind farms. What ministers didn't tell Parliament that day was that the Scottish Government and Crown Estate Scotland explicitly stopped companies paying a vast amount more. There was a cap on bids of £100,000 per square kilometre. That's despite a sale in England and Wales, where there isn't a cap, achieving four times that in initial deposits alone. We know wind farm jobs are going overseas. It happened again in Murray last week. So the First Minister can't tell Parliament this is about employment. Scotland seabed can only be sold once. The sale price matters because if it is cash that flows straight to the Scottish Government's budget for schools and hospitals. Presiding officer, the Scottish Government has sold these national assets on the cheap. They have thrown away a fortune. So can I ask the First Minister, when the auction south of the border netted four times more, why was she still determined to limit how much companies in Scotland should pay? First Minister. Um, firstly, uh, the process used by uh, Crown Estates in making these decisions uh, was fully transparent, uh, right and properly so. Uh, secondly, uh, I think we have to be careful in making these comparisons between uh, the Scottish auction round and uh, similar rounds elsewhere. Uh, there are differences in terms of the complexity of these projects in Scotland, partly to do with the, the depth of the water uh, that these projects are taking place in. Uh, the, the, the other point I would make is that uh, while uh, Alec Cole Hamilton's points about the £700 million are correct, that is not the only income uh, from uh, these projects. Uh, there will be annual rental costs as well. And of course, if we do this correctly, which we are determined to do, uh, then there is going to be very, very significant economic benefit. And my final point would be to remind the Chamber of the vast potential of this, we went into this auction round with a planning assumption of 10 gigawatts 
of offshore wind power. We have come out of that auction round with potentially 25 <coughs> gigawatts of offshore wind power. This is a, a massive, massive opportunity for Scotland and one that all of us should be extremely positive about. Question number four, Jenny Minto. Officer, to ask the First Minister what assurances the Scottish Government has had from the UK Government that the reported privatisation of Channel 4 will not negatively impact on the development of the creative sector across Scotland and the growth of new Scottish talent. First Minister. The Scottish Government strongly opposes the privatisation of Channel 4. In its present form, Channel 4 makes a significant contribution to the creative sector in Scotland, investing more than £200 million in Scottish-based production since 2007 and, of course, opening a creative hub in Glasgow in 2019. Since the announcement of privatisation plans by the UK Government on Twitter, no further information has been forthcoming from the UK Government. As soon as they do provide clarity, we will seek assurances about how they will ensure there is no negative impact on the creative sector in Scotland. Jenny Minto. Thank you for that answer. Does the First Minister share my concern that Channel 4 is currently under threat from a Tory government that appears to be doing all it can to undermine the principles of public service broadcasting for its own narrow political interest? Yeah. First Minister. Yes, I do. Um, I think that is absolutely what is happening. These proposals, I think, represent uh, cultural vandalism. Yeah. Uh, but they do also uh, represent an attempt on the part of the UK Government to undermine public service broadcasting. Uh, I can't see any reason whatsoever uh, why Channel 4 should be privatised, and especially not at the very time it has shown resilience in weathering the pandemic and strengthened its content spend and investment in Scotland. Uh, the, model, the current model is a good one, is a successful one, and it's one that upholds the principles of public service broadcasting, and I think we should all get behind it and seek to see off uh, these misguided Conservative proposals. Question number five, Liz Smith. To ask the First Minister whether she can provide an update on the Scottish Government's strategy to include libraries in the policy to address the attainment gap. First Minister. Libraries deliver a range of benefits, providing vital access to learning materials and resources, uh, helping improve literacy and, of course, tackling the attainment gap. While local libraries are the responsibility of local government, the Scottish Government is committed to directly supporting libraries. As part of our programme for government, we launched a £1.25 million public library COVID relief fund supporting 30 projects across Scotland to remain open uh, and tackle the attainment gap, and that is over and above uh, the money invested since 2017 through the School Library Improvement Fund and the continued uh, annual Public Libraries Improvement Fund, which supports new projects and libraries. And as part of the £1 billion Scottish Attainment Challenge, the Framework for Recovery and Accelerating Progress encourages collaboration across local authority services, including education and local libraries. Elizabeth. The First Minister uh, made great store by the National Strategy for School Libraries, which was launched in 2018, as she just said. Uh, but both the Scottish Library Information Council and SPICE tell me the advisory group met on four occasions in 2018, but there are no records of any recent meetings, no updates on progress made, particularly in terms of how effective the school library fund is being spent, and that a large number of primary schools remain without a library or, just as importantly, without a librarian. First Minister, this strategy was supposed to be a key component in the schools when it comes to addressing the attainment gap, uh, but we know that between 2018 and 21. The curriculum for excellence achievement levels in P1 to P7 literacy actually declined. Why has there been no formal parliamentary update on this strategy, and why are primary school literacy levels going backwards, not forwards? First Minister. Well, I think we are seeing improvements in attainment in Scotland School. All of us understand uh, the impact of COVID uh, after. Uh, the past couple of years, uh, and that makes it all the more important that we focus uh, on initiatives to improve attainment. Um, I will write to the member or ask the Education Minister to write to the member with more details on the work around school libraries, but I did in my answer talk about the investment we are making through the School Library Improvement Fund, which I think demonstrates the commitment of this government to supporting libraries in schools and to supporting local community libraries as well. Michael Mara. Thank you, President Officer. It is absolutely right to highlight the importance of libraries to closing the huge attainment gap we have in Scotland. What does the First Minister have to say to the young people of Kirkton in Dundee, an area of deep deprivation with among the lowest attainment in Scotland, for whom the SNP Government is cutting 79 per cent of attainment funding, and for whom the SNP Council is closing the library? First Minister. Of course, in the decisions we have taken in terms of the attainment funding uh, are in recognition 
uh, of the fact uh, that we see deprivation in all parts uh, of the country and those changes uh, to the allocation of the attainment fund uh, were of course fully supported uh, by COSLA, uh, including the members' own colleagues uh, on COSLA. And in terms of uh, libraries, uh, we continue, as I have said in my earlier answers, to support school libraries uh, through the School Library Improvement Fund, uh, and we will continue to do that. Question number six, Mercedes Vialba. To ask the First Minister what action the Scottish Government is taking to bring down the cost to tenants of private rent in the coming year. First Minister. Uh, we are all aware of the significant pressures facing private renters, which is why our commitment to introduce rent controls is so important. Uh, that means, of course, doing detailed work to ensure that we implement an effective system of rent controls that is right for Scotland, robust against challenge, uh, and one that will stand the test of time. Our housing bill will begin that process and also strengthen existing rights by ensuring anyone who believes that the rent increase is unfair can apply for adjudication without fear of their rent being put up. We are also providing immediate financial support for people who might be struggling. This includes doubling the Scottish Child Payment, as I have already referenced from the start of this month, and investing up to £86 million this year in discretionary housing payments. Mercedes Fialba. I thank the First Minister for that response. While the Scottish Government's commitment to introduce rent controls is, of course, welcome, rents are rising right now, so tenants can't afford to wait three or more years for action. The First Minister has rightly called for more action from the UK Government to help tackle the cost of living crisis, but this Parliament has powers to address one of the biggest pressures facing people in Scotland right now, which is rising rent costs. Some councils have already taken the positive step of introducing rent freezes for social tenants. So will the First Minister com commit today to exploring the implementation of an emergency rent freeze to support all renters in Scotland? First Minister. Uh, as a matter of good faith, I will undertake to explore uh, any suggestion that is made in the Chamber. Uh, we all want to do everything we can to help. Um, I think uh, the member will understand uh, that to legislate, uh, particularly on a complex matter like this, does take time. I think that was recognised uh, by her colleague in the debate uh, before Christmas, Mark Griffin, when he said uh, that uh, they didn't, uh, we certainly do not expect legislation to come into force in year two of this parliamentary session, but we look for details of the framework uh, for the rules. Um, so we will continue to look uh, at how we can, if it is possible, accelerate progress here, but in the meantime, take further action. We have already strengthened tenants' rights uh, in recent years, and of course it is not the case uh, that we are not providing help in the meantime. We have the £10 million tenant grant fund uh, focused on helping private and social tenants who are struggling financially, uh, and we are providing £86 million in housing support uh, this year, and we provided £39 million of additional funding to avoid evictions as a result of the pandemic. And we will continue to make support available, but also continue uh, to look closely at any suggestions for further action that might be made. Thank you. We will now return to general and uh, constituency supplementary questions, and I call Kokab Stewart. Um, thank you, Presiding Officer. I am um, very proud of the record of Glasgow and Glasgow Kelvin in particular of supporting asylum seekers. Could I ask the First Minister what her reaction is to send asylum seekers arriving in the UK to a detention facility in Rwanda for processing? First Minister. I think this uh, decision is utterly abhorrent, uh, morally and ethically abhorrent. It's a total abdication of the UK's moral and international responsibilities to asylum seekers and refugees, and it will also make it more challenging uh, and prolonged for people to say, seek safety from war and persecution. Uh, I think in uh, this decision the UK Government is ignoring the welfare of extremely vulnerable people, um, and for all of these reasons this policy has rightly been condemned by many. Uh, when you hear uh, Theresa May uh, stand up in the House of Commons. And remember, Theresa May was the Home Secretary who sent uh, go home uh, vans around Glasgow, described this policy uh, as morally, ethically, uh, and uh, practically wrong. Then I think all of us have to realise how far from any moral course the UK Government is going on this issue. First Minister, a recent review by Sir Peter Hendy for the UK Government has found that the A75 is the road most in need of an upgrade anywhere in the country. Will you admit that the failure to upgrade this dangerous road, often referred to as a goat track, 
represents a broken promise by the SNP to the people of the South West of Scotland and the haulage and ferry companies that depend on the route to move goods to and from Northern Ireland. First Minister. Uh, no, I don't accept that. Uh, the STPR 2, of course, recommends that safety, resilience and reliability improvements are made on the A75 uh, corridor to support access to Stranraer and to the ports at Cairn Ryan. And we will continue to take decisions that do indeed uh, support that access, which all of us accept and agree is extremely important. Natalie Dawn. Thank you, President Officer. Given the rising cost of living, can I ask the First Minister if she welcomes the announcement yesterday that the newly publicly owned ScotRail will be slashing off-peak ticket prices in half for the month of May? First Minister. Yes, I absolutely uh, welcome uh, this half-price fair offer that, uh, of course, newly uh, publicly owned uh, ScotRail announced yesterday. Uh, this was originally postponed due to Omicron, uh, but people will now be able to book discounted tickets between the 9th and 15th of May for outward travel between uh, the 9th and the 31st of May, with return travel to be completed by the 30th of June. Uh, the ScotRail's Kids for a Quid discount will also uh, be able to be used in conjunction with this offer, uh, which means that up to four children can travel for £1 uh, return each uh, with each adult. Uh, we want people to return to travelling by rail, uh, but we know we need to make it affordable to be a truly attractive alternative to using uh, the car. And public ownership of ScotRail means delivering a service which listens and responds to passenger need, and we will continue to develop further initiatives that make rail a better choice as we work towards our ambitious net zero targets. Graham Simpson. Thank you. The Auditor General has said today that an independent audit was unable to conclude that governance at South Lanarkshire College in East Kilbride was satisfactory over the last year. There have been serious issues at this college. Whistleblowers have made a number of allegations with reported claims of fraud, theft and general malfeasance. The principal, Ailey McKechnie, ordered an audit report which the college is refusing to publish. She and the interim clerk to the board were then suspended. I suspect she was ruffling feathers. The College has now published an action plan that says procedures should be changed in areas such as procurement, preventing bribery and carrying out supplier due diligence. A light needs to be shone on what has been happening at this College. So will the First Minister order an investigation and commit to making its findings public? First Minister. I have some sympathy with the sentiments of that question. I, I know there are uh, significant issues uh, that have been raised. Uh, colleges, of course, are self-governing institutions, but the Scottish Funding Council has an important role, and if the Scottish Funding Council uh, considers it appropriate for there to be further inquiry or investigation, then, of course, it, it is able uh, to do so. Um, I'm happy to consider uh, whether there is any further uh, action uh, or procedure that the Scottish Government can initiate, um, and I will come back uh, to the member in writing if I conclude that that is the case. Russell Finlay. Thank you. Uh, the Parole Board have issued warning letters to 25 life sentence prisoners accused of breaching their licence conditions. Does the First Minister seriously think murderers and rapists will care about a warning letter, or will she back our plans to recall lifers who breach parole and block their future early release? Yeah. First Minister. Um, I think it is right that we have a robust system of parole. If on any occasion it is concluded that that system needs reform, that should happen. But as uh, we have uh, covered in exchanges in this parliament before, it is right uh, that people who commit heinous crimes are properly punished uh, for that, for the, the sake of punishment, but also to keep the public safe. But that we also have a justice system that re uh, supports rehabilitation uh, as well, because that is in the wider public interest. And we will continue to ensure that the parole system is uh, fit for purpose. Thank you. That concludes First Minister's questions. The next item of business is a member's business debate in the name of Katie Clark, and there will be a short suspension to allow those leaving the chamber and public gallery to do so before the debate begins.